Hello, and thank you for giving me the privilege of being here. Let's all give a round of applause for Jan. I just like to do that for general reasons. <laughs> Amazing lady. Amazing lady. So um, I'm going to talk to you about the eyes. Now, uh, I'm going to go by a policy. When I was on the board of directors of the Foundation Fighting Blindness in Canada for many years, we had a policy that when we had meetings where there were many significant participants in the audience who were without vision, that we would not use slides because we want everyone to be equal in their thing. So I am going to... Nice response. I'm going to talk without slides and hopefully be entertaining with no pictures to look at other than my ugly face. Um, and I want to leave plenty of time for questions and answers. So let's talk about vision. We all know that vision is really important part of Ostrom syndrome, and it's something we'd really like to fix, right? Um, but let's start out on the other end of the spectrum. What if we couldn't fix it? What's coming up for the blind? Now, there's going to be a wonderful session, I think, this evening. Marco and others are running that will talk about uh, technology today. But I just wanted to give you a little kind of brief piece of uh, insight of what's happening in the vision community because there really are some amazing things that are happening for those who are without sight at this point in time. Now, I'd like to quote Shannon. Uh, is that okay with you, Shannon? I'm going to quote you, uh, who told me when we had an interesting conversation because there is a controversy going on right now in the uh, vision world of whether we should keep Braille or whether Braille is archaic and should go away. And Shannon said, I paraphrase, give me my Braille any day. And I think he's right on that. Um, you know, we do live in a world of electronics and all kinds of things. Of course, being deafblind is a particular problem because electronic uh, means of communication become even more difficult uh, because hearing can't be used to replace that. So I think Braille will always be around despite this controversy. I'm often asked, when should a child start Braille? We don't know the answer. There's also controversy on that. Obviously, a one-year-old or maybe a two-year-old would have a lot of trouble learning Braille. Uh, and it's hard sometimes to get children who can see to be interested in Braille and a lot of other social obstacles. But I think Braille is here to stay. Nonetheless, there are some very, very exciting developments that some of you may have heard of uh, within the um, uh, non-seeing community. Uh, they range from Google Cars, and uh, you know the Google Car. Uh, I, I have a, a blind man that I work with who does our counseling, who has driven a Google Car, uh, is a quite exciting advancement. The idea that you won't have to see in order to drive. The Google Car just had its first accident after hundreds of thousands of kilometers on the road. It was a small fender bender trying to make a right turn, and I don't think it was the car's fault. I think it was the other driver, the sighted driver's fault, of course. Uh, but, you know, technology really is amazing. Instead of the white cane, there has some, been some suggestion about a sonar device that works kind of like a bat that you carry in the palm of your hand that sends out wavelengths, uh, sends out a, a sonic signal that bounces back and you receive that to know where the obstacles are. Although I have had no people who have used it uh, who are less impressed. Um, eSight, I'm interested, how many of you have heard of eSight? Raise your hand. Has anyone here used eSight yet? So eSight has gotten a tremendous amount of uh, play in the internet and advertising, almost like one of those uh, uh, channels, you know, on television where you can shop and, uh, and they show, you know, the greatest Cuisinart of all time and the greatest non-stick pot of all times. Uh, so it's getting that kind of publicity. It's essentially a video goggle that you place on that takes a video of the world uh, it's really just a magnifier, and I don't think it would have much of a role for someone with Alstrom who has no vision. It may have a role for people who have low vision. It costs, what I understand, thirty to fifty thousand uh, dollars, so it's not for everyone, and that may be why it's getting such high marketing. It's been on television talk shows. Uh, whenever I see something that they uh, say, you know, cures everything, every kind of vision loss known to mankind. I'm always a little skeptical about that, uh, but 
it's something you will hear about. I have not yet had the opportunity to use it. Uh, there's many other devices like it that are goggles, essentially, that rely on magnification and video projection. Um, another really cool and exciting thing is tongue vision. Who's heard of tongue vision? Ah, just a couple of people. Tongue vision has been developed in Israel. It is absolutely outstanding, and I have seen this in action. Your tongue has as many nerve fibers in it uh, as your fingertips. It's one of the most sensitive organs in your body. And by using a kind of a, a chip, it's a flexible chip that you put on your tongue, you can teach your tongue to see. So a video camera takes pictures of the world, sends these messages onto your tongue, and your brain can learn, instead of using your tongue as a taste receptor, it can learn to use your tongue as a visual receptor. And people who have this, who are totally blind, no light perception, can identify from a set of chairs which one has a person sitting in it, can identify where the chair is, and can read letters in front of them at near that are several inches tall. But still, that's a, a far cry from no light perception. Very exciting, uh, not yet in the very clinically uh, available stages, but this is the kind of technology that's coming our way to help those who currently are without sight. Lastly, um, I'm sure several of you, let's see how many have heard of Argus 2. Yeah, so Argus 2 is a uh, chip that we put on the retina. We're doing it now at Will's Eye Hospital in Philadelphia and several centers around the country. This is essentially a bionic retina, for those of you who are old enough to remember the six million dollar man, the bionic man. Uh, and it's a chip that goes onto your retina and it is stimulated again by goggles that have a video camera. And uh, it's, what it's doing is it's taking advantage of the fact that the way your retina is structured, even when the rods and cones die, which is what primarily happens in most genetic retinal disorders and also in Alstrom initially, the inner parts of the retina are still alive. And therefore, if you directly stimulate the inner parts of the retina that would otherwise be stimulated by your rods and your cones, that you can get a message generated that can be interpreted to the optic nerve in the brain. The problem with the Argus II is, number one, it's very expensive. It's predicted to be about $100,000 per implant. Insurance companies, although it is now FDA approved, have not figured out how to pay for this. And number three, the vision you get from the Argus really isn't that great. In fact, some people don't see much better than what we call light perception with projection. In other words, they can see the outline of a doorway. They can see some lighting enough to navigate. Uh, that's very exciting to people who may otherwise have no light perception. But in general, not really that thrilling so far. We have had some patients who've done better. Uh, but what is exciting is a new chip that's coming out. It'll, Wills will be the only site actually in the United States. It's in Germany right now, which goes under the retina as opposed to on top of the retina. And that's now stimulating the retina from the side that it's normally supposed to be stimulated from. And early work does show that this gives better vision. People can identify a piece of fruit, for example. Is it a banana or an apple? They can read uh, letters that are about 12 inches tall in front of them. They can identify shapes. Uh, so that's very promising, and we're expecting that in the United States sometime in 2017 requires surgery, requires wearing glasses. The risks seem to be not very large. And if you have no light perception, what have you got to lose, right, with an operation on your eye? Uh, but these are some of the exciting advances for the people who have no sight now. More importantly is what can we do to prevent vision loss in Ostrom disease and maybe bring back or halt vision loss and people who have not yet gone to the no light perception stage. As we know, that's pretty much the end game in Alstrom. Everybody eventually loses their vision at some point in time, although there is a variation. Some people lose it more slowly, some people lose it more quickly. We hear a lot about stem cell. Now we'll have fun. Who's heard of stem cell? Every hand goes up, right? And I hate to tell you, but stem cell is a buzzword. 
It's an exciting, sexy buzzword, okay? And what stem cells are, are the idea of taking a cell that has the potential to become another kind of cell. And actually, we all have stem cells in our body. The controversy over stem cells started some time ago uh, when we had to use uh, fetuses to get stem cells because all of us started from stem cells, right? The egg and the sperm together fertilize, essentially make a stem cell that has the ability to grow into many, many different cells, one of which is retina cells or heart cells or kidney cells. So the idea that you could have such cells and then direct them through engineering, so to speak, in the laboratory to tell them what to be is very real. We can do that. In fact, we have the ability now to take cells from your eye, from your skin, from other parts of your body, and create your own stem cells so that you don't need to have stem cells donated from someone else. You get your own stem cell, and then in the laboratory, that can be directed. In fact, there's some very exciting videos online where you can see a stem cell that becomes a beating heart cell, a cell that actually beats independently. And that raises the idea that could we then turn this into something that knows how to become a heart? And likewise, could we turn these into cells that will become a retina? And we can take stem cells and we can place them underneath the retina with a tiny little needle and hope that they will induce to form new retinal cells. Well, we're really in the early, early phase of that. We're doing it right now at Wills and at other centers for certain diseases, largely diseases right now where there's a big area in the retina that's dead and we want to repopulate it with new cells. You could think of it like a retina transplant, but we really can't do a retina transplant. The retina is like wet tissue paper. Um, you can't really move it from one person to another. That's not going to work real well. But being able to grow a new retina is a possibility. We're very early in that game right now. The results are very preliminary, so we, there has not yet been a person with any disease who's really gotten demonstrably better vision. In fact, when we see demonstrably better vision, we usually think the study's not true. Um, and part of the problem is not only does that cell have to learn to become a retina cell, it has to hook up with other cells in the retina to send the message. So that's early on in the game, but it's very exciting, and it looks like for some diseases it may be helpful. Will it be helpful for Alstrom? We don't know yet, because in Alstrom, the whole retina is dead. You may recall that some of you were kindly participants in this very hotel, uh, was it two years ago? Two years, three years ago, uh, when we brought our OCT machine here. That paper's uh, just being out for publication right now. Uh, after much data analysis, we were able to learn, thanks to your participation, when the retina dies and how it dies. And that helps us strategize as to when's the best time is to intervene in terms of the potential of these kinds of therapies. The question is whether new cells will bring the day. Another opportunity would be to exploit cells that are still alive there, something called optogenetics. And optogenetics uses chemistry from animals, essentially, that we can place into cells that normally don't sense light but live in your retina for other reasons and turn them into light sensing cells, kind of a transplant per se, a chemical transplant to redirect their function. That's also in the early stages, also very exciting. And I think probably a better idea for Ostrom where the outer retina, the inner retina, dies after the cones and the rods die first. But that brings us to gene therapy. And everybody's heard of gene therapy. Now, gene therapy is a word that means many, many different things. For example, why not just go in and put in a new Alstrom gene? Sounds easy, right? I would love to do that. What's really exciting and neat is that gene therapy in the eye is extremely real. It's here. We're doing it today for other diseases. For example, in a disease called labor congenital amaurosis, type 2, a disease where there's a mutation in a specific gene that causes children to be blind, essentially, at birth. 
um, uh, we can put this gene under the retina. It's currently, it's going to be improved. It's uh, just finished the phase three trial. Uh, and some children have gone from essentially only able to see a hand in front of their face to playing baseball, riding a bike, going to a normal school, and reading. That is exciting. And the eye is a very, very special organ because it's isolated from the rest of the body in a way that we call immune privilege. And it's because of that immune privilege that gene therapy in the eye, we don't have to worry about it mucking up something else in the body. So many of you may have heard the story of a, a young man named Jesse Gelsinger many years ago who had gene therapy and died at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and that put a moratorium on gene therapy throughout the country for quite some time. But that was the effects of gene therapy on the rest of his body. That wasn't for his eye, it was for a disease in his liver. So the eye offers a very unique opportunity because the body's protected. Also, I know it sounds gross, it's pretty easy for us to stick needles in the eye. I won't do that to you here, but nowadays we actually do put needles in patients' eyes to inject medicines right in the clinic, in the office, sitting up in a chair. No anesthesia, nothing. So our ability to inject things into the eye is really unique. You can't do that for your heart or for your liver very easily without significant risk. In the eye, we can even put genes under the retina. Uh, not the easiest thing in the world, it requires general anesthesia, but the eye is a great place to do gene therapy. And that's why the eye is ahead of every other organ in the body in terms of our ability to do this. Now the patients who had labor congenital amaurosis probably are gonna need other injections in the future that it doesn't last forever. Um, and that may be the way gene therapy goes. But now there are trials in Bardet-Biedel syndrome, a syndrome as you know that is very close to Alstrom disease for the I gene, or at least for one of the types right now and another type expected. And for multiple other genetic eye disorders, we're seeing this type of gene therapy. But remember, I told you that gene therapy means many different things. One of the problems with Alstrom is that the gene is very, very big. We can't just like take genes out of our pocket and inject them into an eye. They have to have a way of not only getting in through a needle, but incorporating themselves into the cells of the eye so they can be useful to the cells to keep working. So we use a virus to carry that gene in and then Viruses do what they normally do. When you get the common cold from a virus, the virus is infecting your cells and its DNA, so to speak, is getting involved with your DNA and it's doing its own thing in the cells. Well, we can do that with the retina, but viruses can only handle pieces of, or genes that are so big. And the Alstrom gene is a little too big for that. But suffice it to say, people are working on the ways to get big genes in. And there's another big gene called CEP290, which causes the LCA, another form of uh, labor congenital amaurosis uh, that people are trying to use as a model for getting bigger genes in. But there's other ways of doing gene therapy. We could perhaps fix a broken gene. And now there is technology that will allow us to essentially gene edit or fix genes, something called CRISPR and other technologies that open up that possibility. Again, the eye is the perfect place. We heard a wonderful talk yesterday from France about a kind of gene therapy, the idea of altering the metabolic pathways of vision, right? So whatever step Alstrom is mucking up, if we could redirect that pathway uh, and allow function to be restored, and we're already doing that. There's an artificial rhodopsin molecule Rhodopsin is the primary kind of pigment in the eye that senses light that's been given by mouth as a pill. And patients began to see better in another form, another disease, a uh, form of labor congenital amaurosis. So this idea of gene manipulation, we'll call it, either putting in a new gene, fixing the broken gene, or perhaps kind of working around the genetic pathway by altering or manipulating the genetic pathway are really ways that are very, very open uh, to good work. Uh, and Jan knows that I'm on her case. We gotta start to work on this a little harder uh, in Alstrom disease. 
Um, but there are some particular challenges in Alstrom, and we need to recognize those. Huge gene, retina dies early, right? And the whole retina dies. So that creates some obstacles for us, but I am very, very confident. In fact, I stand before you today, and I have no doubt in my mind that we are past the era of if, and we are now into the era of when. I think that every patient, you're all young enough, who has Alstrom in this room, will have the opportunity to see again by one way or another. I have no doubt. Uh, it really is no longer just a fantasy or a science fiction. It is very real, and in ophthalmology, we have that luxury uh, to tell you that there will be a restoration for vision, I think, within the lifetime of every person in this room. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, reminder, if you have questions, raise your hand. I'll get a mic to you. You mentioned that the eye is separate from the, from the rest of the body. It has some, something, I believe, the quote I have here in my notes is immune privilege. What does that mean? So um, if, mm -hmm. a little complicated, but it goes like this. If I put a piece of foreign matter in your bloodstream, right? if I injected dirt or maybe a bacteria from an infection in your bloodstream, your body goes nuts, right? It's going to try and fight that because you have an immune system which is designed to fight off foreign invaders, right? Your eyeball, although it has its own system, is not, the rest of the body doesn't recognize foreign material in the eye, so to speak. So, for example, if you get leukemia, right? Leukemia is in your blood, it gets to all your organs, it's not good for you. Leukemia in your eye is a very bad thing. But the reason why it's bad is it's hard to treat because even with chemotherapy and everything, once it's in your eye, it's like a safe harbor. It's hiding there. So your eye is kind of disconnected in some ways from the rest of your body. So by putting in this foreign material, a virus, right, we really don't see your whole body bringing out the foreign legion to attack it. In fact, the local inflammatory response is very limited. Thank you. The question up front that left her chair. Raise your hand. I'm not seeing a hand. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm Melina from Greece. Some more information about what's going on in Germany, please. Um, uh, this chip, is, is it something really taking place already or is it in the future? So, the, the, as I said, the chip is like an artificial retina. Right? It's like a, a mechanical retina. Uh, and what makes that chip unique is its position in the eye, but also its resolution. So when you take, you've heard of pixels, right? And high definition television. The old televisions were grainy. New televisions look more realistic. So if we can increase the pixelation, the pixels on a chip, and we can make it have more power and more definition, then your vision is better. I am absolutely certain that within our lifetimes, not only will those chips get better, but eventually people will have superhuman vision and be better, able to see better than 2020. People who were once blind will see better than normal people because it's just a technology issue now of how can we get the pixels better. I mean, it took us a long time with television to go from those old black and whites to today's high definition TV, it's the same process of refining, right, the ability of the chip to resolve small details more and more and more, that means better vision. Can I have an additional question, sure. please? Yes. Uh, you know all of us in all the countries are looking for, uh, are getting information about perspectives in the eye, in, in, in restoring vision. So what is the way to get reliable information I mean, we hear in the news, new spectacles. Uh, yeah. what, is, what would be um, a normal parent uh, method to keep track with, this, with reliable so information? I'll make a few suggestions. Thank you. The internet is a very dangerous place, right? 
you read all this stuff out there, and it just makes you crazy. So uh, there's a few things you can do. Number one, there's a website which is very helpful. It's called www.clinicaltrials.gov, G-O-V. And that's a study we, a site we use as well. Anybody can go on there, type in Ostrom, and you'll see what comes up. Type in whatever you want, whatever disease you have, and you'll see what comes up. And it'll tell you what studies are around the world and who's doing what and what kind of things are going on. Uh, it's useful to some degree, though, because you have to have some knowledge to be able to sort out what the meaning is and is it good and is it bad. Uh, and should I or shouldn't I get involved? And, you know, should I believe it or not believe it? <clears throat> I think ultimately what I tell my patients is to use me. You know, use your eye doctor. You can all use me. I don't care. But I tell my patients, you know, shoot me an email. If you see something, let me know. And I'll comment on it or I'll look into it. I'll get back to you. That's what we do for our patients. So when a patient comes to me with any disease and we look and we see what studies are out there, we connect, we contact the study sites for them. We research any particular studies. Do they make sense? Are they worth involving? What do they cost? Do they pay for your travel expenses? And then we feed that back to the patient. That's part of what we do. Um, but really, anyone can send me uh, an email anytime. Jan has my email. Uh, and I think, you, you know, be in touch with your own eye doctors as long as you're being seen by someone who knows what they're doing. In ophthalmology, with rare disorders, we have a new specialty in ophthalmology called ocular genetics. There's only about, we figured it out the other day, there's only about 70 of us in the world. It's really a, an emerging specialty, people who specialize in ocular genetics. But we're out there and we're around, and we can get someone usually, maybe not in your country, but in a nearby country. Uh, there's probably about 15 of us in the United States. So there are places you can go if you have eye questions, people are familiar with the disease. Yes? www.clinicaltrials.gov. The word clinical trials is all one word with an S on the end. Yes, in the back. My daughter still has a really good vision and she does not have the light sensitivity at all. Is there a chance that she may never lose her vision? So, light sensitivity is something we wrote about a long time ago as an early symptom in Alstrom, but not everybody goes the same way, right? And over time, light sensitivity often gets better in many patients with, uh, with uh, Alstrom. We never know what the future holds for any particular child. Jan, what's the oldest patient who was still sighted? Has any light perception? Okay, so 35-year-old with light perception. So if you look at the average, and you know, the average isn't in the favor of a patient with Alstrom syndrome, most people will lose their vision at some point in time. We do know that some people are slower than others. So the, the question is, how do we get in there sooner, right? Before that occurs, to maintain that retinal function or reverse the process. And, you know, if, uh, for a kid who's five years old today, I don't think they're going to, I think it's absolutely certain that by the time they're 30, there's going to be a treatment for this. There's no question in my mind. So we have plenty of age range for our young kids, and now the question is how do we get back vision for the old kids? And when we look at the labor experiment, you know, we, we're hopeful. Now, can you make a dead retina come back to life is a harder question. And that's one that we have to, to wrestle with, and one of the reasons we did the study that we did three years ago here to learn that process. More questions? Any up in front? Up front here. And you had a question, too. No? Right here. I think I saw a hand up over right there. here and here and here. So the question uh, from um, Oceani is uh, she wants to know, even at the point when a patient has lost their sight entirely, is there still a hope that through therapy that they might be able to get their sight again? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think the, the hope for getting vision back is very, very strong. 
And I think that we've seen that in other diseases, uh, whether it comes from an electronic chip, or it comes from a stem cell, or it comes from some form of gene therapy, I think those possibilities are not only real, uh, but they're happening right now for patients with other diseases. My question kind of goes along with that. When speaking of the, uh, the gene therapy and versus the, or, or along with the chip, I know it's all kind of new and in, in a preliminary stages, but in your opinion, or, or if there's been other uh, and more advanced research on it, is there one that shows more hope for a, uh, the long term, uh, the chip versus the, the gene therapy, the regeneration, especially in those whose cones have already died? Hard to answer that question of which is better. We know that the chip next year is going to be here. And I've already talked to Jan about maybe having an arm of the study just for patients with Alstrom syndrome, for example, because it's a very well characterized uh, possibility. There are some complications because of the other health concerns and that it requires a, a surgical operation. Some patients would be more eligible than others, right? Because we can't, in a research project, um, submit people to major health risks for a procedure that's research. Um, so that would probably be the one that's going to be down the pike the soonest, right? Um, but I don't know which one's going to win the day. That we don't know yet. Lots of people working on trying to figure out that answer. Thank you. Is there, is there one over here in the middle? Oh, there you go. You heard a yes? Um, you were talking about the gene therapy. Um, I was wondering about if you've, if you've had a transplant or implant, how would that affect it? Would it still be a possibility, or do you know? So that's a great follow-up question, because really one of the challenges in Ostrom, and not, the, not insurmountable, is, let me give you an example. Let's say a person's perfectly normal except for their eye disease. Uh, and you want to put them in a research trial to have them see better from whatever it is, gene therapy or whatever. When we do those research trials, we try to be very clean in the beginning and only enroll people who have no other confounding factors. So let's say that same patient had only one eye because another eye had an injury. Or let's say that same patient had glaucoma in that eye, unrelated to their underlying condition, they likely wouldn't be eligible for the trial, the clinical trial, because they've got another something going on that's unrelated and that would muck up our interpretation of the results. Likewise, in patients who have some, have Alstrom or other diseases where there's other systemic problems, we have to make sure that those systemic problems don't get in the way of interpreting the research. So I don't know the answer to the question of what problems might limit what we could do. And for example, when we talk about having Alstrom page, patients with Alstrom enroll in this new CHIP trial, there's going to be some limitations about who's healthy enough to undergo surgery. And if you're not healthy enough, if you're, you may not be a candidate for the initial trial, but once it gets approved, then you may be deemed able to consent and roy the risks and benefits of having the surgery if you wanted it. But there's nothing in of itself about a transplant that should get in the way, except if you're on transplant medications, like steroids and all that. Does that alter if they are on, like, immunosuppressants? Yeah, those kind of medications would very well alter your eligibility for a research trial whether it would alter your eligibility once something is past the research stage and clinically available is a whole other question that's hard to answer. Was there a hand down front? Right I saw. there in the second table. Are there any clinical trials presently that um, would be able to treat Ostrom? Because several years ago, when we were down at NIH, the ophthalmologist there had told us at the time that there was two that were available. One they were not uh, eligible for because of the nystagmus, but the other one they would be eligible for. 
following year, I asked the ophthalmologist that they see about it, and he said he was not aware of anything. Currently, there are no vision-specific, Alstrom-specific <clears throat> clinical trials going on. There are some clinical trials, in particular with stem cell right now, which are open to a wider range of patients with retinal degenerative diseases, but currently none of those trials would accept the patient with Ostrom syndrome because of the other confounding factors of the disease. Um, our job, my job, Jan's job, is to make that happen for Ostrom syndrome, and I think that's something we're going to see happen uh, in the not too distant future. So basically, what the ophthalmologist told us at NIH that they would be eligible for that one really wouldn't be of benefit for the Yeah, Alzheimer's. I don't know what that study was. Do you know, Jan? I don't know either. I, I don't recall what, you know, they explained it to us at the time, but I don't recall what it was. My guess is it was a broader retinal dystrophy study that was right. looking at multiple different kinds of genetic retinal degenerations. Okay. All right, thank you. My pleasure. I think I'm uh, past my limit, so I'm going to thank you very much and just make an offer to you. Listen, I'm here uh, until Sunday morning. Um, I'm not sure if I'm here for all of the curbside consult sessions, but if anybody wants to grab me or set up a time to sit down and chat, I'm happy to answer questions on a one-on-one -on -one basis, uh, whatever I can do to uh, honor the privilege of being here and able to work with you. Thank you.